Hello and welcome to today's webinar where we're going to be discussing all things about taking your CPD online. My name is Sarah Drury and I'm from Redback Connect and I'm joined by Lloyd Gross from Pointsfield. How are you today? Very good, thank you. Great to have you. So today it's all about uncovering online CPD and I'm sure as many of you are aware, there's been so many changes when it comes to the world of online events and meetings and webinars over the past few months with everything happening. So today is really about um, giving you some practical tips and advice to take away so you can not only take your CPD online but also enhance the professionalism of your organisation as well. So before we get into it, I just want to give you some tips on how you can interact with the platform. Please feel free to ask a question by clicking on the blue raise hand icon. Those questions will actually come through to me and I'll be able to then ask Lloyd or myself, depending on who wants to answer it. Um, and then also there's a resource folder which we will be referring to at different intervals of the presentation. And that's a light blue um, arrow pointing downwards. There's lots of documents and blogs and resources in there for you to actually download. So let's get into it first of all. Here's just an overview, Lloyd, of what we're going to go through today. And what are you probably most excited, what's good you, you excited over the past few months coming out of COVID when it comes to the online world? Well, I, I think that um, uh, you know, we've had a, a strong online um, offering uh, through most of the uh, mm. professional organisations for a long time. But this has really focused us now. Yep. And so we now had to really think through how we're delivering mm. services. Yep. Um, and it's not just how you're delivering CPD and, and uh, events, but it's how you're doing things like AGMs and mm. all kinds of other things. So yeah. um, it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's really changed the landscape. Yeah. So it's clear that we need to look to the online environment or even look to some hybrid solutions to be able to reach people at a distance. Um, but what we've seen recently is a lot of people making that switch, but sometimes not knowing where to start. So once we've made the decision to go online, what what should we do next? What are the next steps for organisations looking to take this online? Well, I think that um, you know, the, the un understanding your members mm. is, is you know, key to this, but, but then um, understanding how you're unpacking those events and how you're, 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 um, you're, you're taking those, uh, those events to the online environment. So, um, so um, you know, when you're looking at it as well, I mean, one of the things I think that um, is, is important to think through is not just um, how we're we doing one thing, but how you might cascade that, mm. that, um, that content into a range of other things. So, for instance, um, webinars can be the, the, the sort of the focus or the, the, the building blocks to actually then building more mm. on-demand you know, on services or on-demand units of, of, of training. Um, and um, and if, if, if the um, planning the webinar is done correctly and, and, and you've thought through how to sort of um, present those chunks uh, in the webinar, then you can actually pull them mm. um, into an online uh, training program as well. So I guess the first step is to really look in, to really take a look at how your face-to-face -face events are actually working. And you talk about blended learning. So can you just go through these four areas for me? Well, so um, blended learning is, is, a, is a, it sort of started in the classroom. Mm. So, um, but it's, it's, um, it's using a range of, of, um, of technologies and, um, and also um, the way people are learning. So for instance, the flipped, uh, that we call a flipped, cl flipped mm. classroom. I mean, a good example of that is that what used to happen is that you'd go to class and you'd have um, information dumped in your head yeah. and then you'd be asked to go home and do a test or yeah. not uh, yeah. homework. Yeah. Whereas the flipped classroom is all about actually equipping people with the initial mm. um, uh, key learning um, ideas mm. so that when they come to the actual class, mm. um, they are able to chat together and use mm. peer support to actually uh, unpack a lot of, the, um, a, a lot of the, the concepts. And the good thing about that, of course, is that we've got uh, people with different um, skill levels and, uh, and that, that sort of blended learning um, uh, uh, methodology actually ha you know, gives pe gives a sort of equity mm. um, of, um, of of training. So um, so I mean, really, I think that the important thing is to look at how you're doing your presentations. Really think through um, you know how to use technology to kind of um, to help with all these components. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the um, you know online training is uh, is. I mean, all of the 
even schools had to go to online training. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's becoming um, much more acceptable to do that now. Mm -hmm. um, people are already understanding the benefits of doing it. Uh, and, um, uh, and it's a good part of a, of a full program. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I just want to quickly touch on um, adapting to the online world as well. So first of all, there's three main tips that uh, we recommend here at Redback when it comes to adapting content to the online world. And the first thing is to really think of, and I think Lloyd, you'd agree with this, we can't just take exactly what we're currently doing and expect to adapt that content online or sorry, um, presented online without sort of changing it up a bit. So my first thing, first thing that I want to go through is look at what you're currently doing and what sort of on, what sort of training programs you're currently running and then map out the differences of how that might look online. And a key difference really, I think, is the content because not everyone's going to sit behind a computer screen for an entire day to learn. Um, I don't think people have the capacity to do that. Um, I don't think um, the, that environment is how it should be set up. Um, I think you're Correct. sort of setting yourself up for a failure and people aren't going to retain that information as well. It was heads exploded about two hours. So yeah. You want to cut, bring it right way back from yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, it is the average event um, is around probably the 45 to 60 yep. minute mark. Yep. Um, and I think people, that's their capacity when it comes to learning information. But when it comes to CPD and it does come to accreditation, I think you can extend that a little bit further. But there are some key key things that you need to take into consideration. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is um, streaming. So for those of us who actually um, provide accreditation for um, conferences, so mm -hmm. any sort of physical events, you don't want to necessarily stream every single thing. So you briefly right. mentioned live and on-demand recordings yep. as well. I would think if you've got a full day event and it is um, CPD accredited, really start to think about with that content that you're producing, how is that going to look online? And I'll give you an example. Uh, we've got a client who does this regularly and this weekend they've got their other CPD event coming up. And originally it was a two-day conference. What they've actually done is they've pre-recorded all their content mm -hmm. from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. It's actually happening tomorrow. They're going to stream that content as if, as if it was live. Mm -hmm. And they're the keynote presentations or the sessions that would have been the most important, um, the ones that sort of fill the seats, if yep. you like. The auditorium one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So they've got four hours of that content, but they've also taken into consideration that after four hours on a Saturday, no one's going to sit behind the screen and watch everything. Yep. So what they've actually done, they're then redirecting everyone to some on-demand sessions yep. that have been yep. recorded. So there's six of those and people can watch them and they have two weeks to actually watch those sessions mm. to get their points. Mm. So to me, that blended approach exactly. that you were talking about um, in the traditional training model can actually be adapted to the online environment. And all you really have to do is think like an attendee and think, what would I want? Would I want to give up an entire Saturday? You have to remember when you're at these events, these physical events, you've got networking, yep, you've got right. catering provided, you know, you, you look forward and, to the breaks. And the the, um, uh, the 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 people behind the scenes are turning the, the, uh, the temperature down yeah. so it keeps you awake. Yep. So, you know, the whole lot of, um, of, of, of tricks that yeah. uh, organisations do to keep people yeah. awake and, and engaged. But yep. you can't do that when you've got... Um, yeah, so I briefly touched on live versus on-demand content and I want to just go into um, on-demand a little bit as well and I know it's just going to come up throughout the today's session in quite a fair bit. Um, we've definitely seen a rise in on-demand content over the past few months and I think that's because um, a lot of people, we're living in this Netflix sort of generation, if you like, and people want to watch something when they want to. So right. how is this impacting? Wanna, yeah. yeah, like should we be take it in small parts. Should we be concerned if people aren't attending your CPD events live or should you even host them on demand? Well um I think that we've got to be able to think through <clears throat> that um you know, we've got a, a, a range, a cohort of mm. individuals from young people through to older people yep. who are all needing this resource. And and, and um Different generations consume this sort of resource mm. in different ways as well. So yep. you've got um, you know um, younger uh, generations now wanting to time shift and to have on demand, have things when they want it, when you know how they want it on the device they want it. Um, whereas you know tradi more traditional um, uh, event going people 
uh, have um, have grown up with this sort of thing and, and expect it to be <clears throat> in some sort of deliverable fashion that way too. I think that um, one of the things that I'm seeing out of the COVID, mm. <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things I'm seeing out of the COVID um, pandemic is that I think that conferences have had uh, you know, the, the, the final nails in the, mm. co in the coffin of, co of conferences, um, largely because I think, um, you know, we've, you know, this part of this is that, you know, that people have flipped their conferences so they're basically delivering it in exactly the same way they would deliver it mm. um, in face-to-face -face and in an auditorium. They're delivering it on, online. And, um, and that's, a, that's what they're doing is a couple of things. Firstly, um, it's not respecting the, the kind of the, the way it's, it's got to be delivered. But also, um, the, the, um, uh, it's not um, allowing for the, um, the, the sort of the, the shifting nature of this stuff. So, and we've got this, this um, uh, we've got, um, you know, carbon uh, footprint for conferences. We've got, mm. um, you know, they're very expensive. Um, and actually what we're finding when, when you flip them um, is that there's not that much educational outcomes. Mm. You know, it's not that much um, that, you know, if you're going to give two days, there's not that much educational stuff mm. coming out of these conferences. Um, and, and this shift, if you flip it, is, um, is showing that. Mm. So we've got to be very smart about the way we're doing this, I think. Yeah. Um, I think as well, when it comes to live and on demand, one of the good things to note is if you do have people who are presenting in a live capacity, there are some other things that you can do with your presenters. So you've got some tips yeah. here around keeping them afterwards yep. to record some extra content um, and then host that on demand and maybe set up some modules as well. I think that's a great tip. Yeah, so, so the, the, the concept of that is that um, you know, when you've got a speaker coming in and speaking for a, a brief amount of time, um, what you'll find is that they are editing down what they've got. And mm. so um, if you ask them to do things like keep a list of what they've edited out of their, 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 um, uh, uh, their, their, their demonstration, mm. then, um, you know, if you keep that list and then you actually go afterwards and, mm. uh, and film maybe a, a half hour, you've got them there, you may, yeah. you've got all the technology there, if you then um, take that extra content and record it, then that becomes extra components that you can cascade down into... Mm. Um, uh, into um, on-demand events. And I think the, um, and I see a few organisations doing this lately, recording the one-minute promo as yeah. well to actually advertise upcoming events. And we're not really going to go into marketing um, content today, but, you know, when it does come to that, that extra one-minute snippet to really engage people, especially presenter, just say, look, uh, either beforehand, so if you're marketing live content, saying, Hi, everyone. Um, really looking forward to you joining me um, on my event. Um, it's happening at this time and date. We're going to cover off these three things. Or even after the event as well and using these one-minute videos to actually promote your um, events on LinkedIn as well. And yeah. I think and make sure they get captioned as well because perfect social, for social media. Perfect for social. And yes, you're right. Captions are important. And I think, you know, we were talking earlier as well and the big thing when it comes to um, live versus on demand is how interactive do you want this to be or can you make it interactive afterwards. So um, we saw organisations being really, really creative during COVID. And one of the things that they did, they didn't have access to all the presenters um, because people were busy, um, yeah. people were in uncertain times, and they also had presenters internationally as well. So what they did, they actually pre-recorded content, but then after the actual, after people watched that content, they actually had the speakers online doing a live yeah. Q&A through a video conference as well. So once again, how interactive does it need to be? But if it really does need to be interactive, you can use that blended approach again. And I think that word blended is something we're going to be using quite a lot today, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, it is. And, and I think that the other thing is that if you're um, doing, oh, there's a lot of mm. international organisations who are doing virtually the same thing in different time, mm. time zones. And so it's good to have the mm. capacity to say, right, you know, here's the recorded bit and then we're going to have the speakers in yep. just that small bit at the end to be yeah. to have it interactive. Yep, absolutely. So, um, so, interactivity, I know. So, we're talking about <laughs> so um, how do you keep things spontaneous yeah. and interactive? Um, and, and what would you actually mean by that? So let's just go into that a little bit more because I want to talk about the different features that are available, um, but also being sure that you don't use the everything just because of the sake of it. So if you think about the online environment, um, as someone who's attending your event, there's a lot going on. And you have to remember these are learning events. So 
Ultimately, you want them to comprehend and learn. So if you automatically just open up every interactive feature on the actual platform, you're really going to overwhelm people. Yeah. And you've got to think of the different senses that are at play here and, diff and different learning styles as well. So you're listening, you're watching, you're thinking, and then you're going to ask me to type in chat questions to you as well. Then you're going to ask me to maybe do video chat. So there's a whole range of things that can go on. So once you break down your actual events and the formats, here are some tools that you can actually um, integrate or switch on in the platform if you like. So private chat, Private chat is a great way to submit questions to the moderator and speakers, so exactly like we have here today. So any questions, feel free to submit them and they will come through. And these are great because afterwards you can export the transcripts of all the questions that were asked during the event and then you can actually um, maybe write an FAQ if you like, maybe you can send out responses to some questions that weren't answered, but a great way for people to have that private chat and I think it, it, we talk about the online environment, but even when it comes to online, people can still be embarrassed to ask that question, yeah. um, that first right. question. Yeah. Right. So sometimes it's like having some Dorothy Dix of fake questions as well and yep. reading those out so that will prompt the audience to as well. Um, open chat is another thing. And we've seen um, some organisations use open chat and private chat recently. And what that actually does the open chat is used to create a community and it, um, it encourages this discussion and this free flow communication. However, you need to have a moderator when it comes yeah. to live chat. You need to have someone there who's replying back to someone, facilitating that conversation. Great tip, lovely to hear that. This is great. And it has to be different from the private chat. And this works great if you've got the same sort of people coming on your event on a regular basis, doesn't it? Yeah, and and you don't want you don't want individuals to dominate as well. So you yes. need to be able to spread that um, that that uh, conversation. And you also don't want trolls as well. So this is right. you really need to think about the types of people who, and you know, there's always one definitely mm. yep. for any any yes, of these things. Absolutely. But think about the types of events, um, the topics that you're running as well. If the topics are a little controversial when it comes to these learning environments, then open chat might not be the best. But maybe. Maybe, you know, the first session, open up private chat and then for the next module, okay, we had private chat before, we're going to open um, a public chat to everyone now. But there's some other ways that you can also just encourage this two-way communication. So video chat, so like the TV show Q&A, you can get people to actually submit um, a video of themselves asking a question and you can play that through the actual event. That's a very creative way. Um, Pre-chat, so in the actual registration um page where you're asking people to register for the event, you can ask them to submit a question there that they would like covered um, through the actual event and that also is given to your presenter ahead of time so they can actually think of responses and tailor their content. Um, but you know, there's nine different ways that we've come up with at Redback to take questions in your next virtual event and you can take a look at that blog by clicking on the resource folder. Um, it's there, I think it's the fourth document as well. And then the other thing is polls as well. So. Poll early and poll often. That's <laughs> um, polls. Many organisations use polls um, as quizzes in their events. Um, many of them use them um, for CPD related activities, so making sure that people are answering those questions. And the good thing about this is it's a great way to see if people are actually paying attention as well. It's also very good to be able to reflect back to yep. um, uh, to the co to people who are attending what the yep. view of the people attending are. So, you know, if you're asking, a, especially a controversial question, um, it's interesting to then distribute to display the results immediately yeah. and everyone goes, wow, that's, um, that, yeah. that didn't expect that. I've just opened a poll as well. So, and it's just a fun one because I just really want to get an indication of how many online events people have actually attended um, in the past month. Because it's for us, it's like, oh, do you know what? It, this time, 12 months ago, I think we attend, you know, it'd be like maybe one a month or something, whereas now people are just consumed by online, online content as well. Um, so we've actually opened that poll and we can see those results coming through. Um, and, yeah, 50% of people are actually saying well over 10. Um, yeah. So, And there's a great way for us to actually share these results with the online audience as well. And this, we actually, this is another way that um, an organisation ran their events and it was really to get a sense, um, it was very emotive, the material they were presenting. So at the beginning of the presentation, they asked, so i just close this now, um, they actually asked, um, how are you feeling? And it was um, a tribal webinar. 
And then at the end of the session, they also ask them again. Or they, you know, polls can be used to ask right now, um, uh, how how familiar are you with this topic? Halfway through, um, are your learning outcomes being met? And then at the end, how have your learning outcomes been met? So starting to gather that data about attendees, and it's also useful for your presenters as well, isn't it? Oh, yeah, very much so. I mean, it, and it's, um, I mean, when, when I was doing um, these things for the Public Relations Institute, the one thing I tried to do um, was, was um, have the feedback available to uh, the attendees instantly after, yep. as soon as they finished um, the, the event. And then I wrapped it up, uh, wrapped all the data up and gave it straight to the presenter. So, um, and then I benchmarked it as well. So um, they could see sort of where they sat in sort of a, in, in a, sort of a, a, de, a de-identified benchmark. So it's, and, and they love it. They, yeah. uh, they really, because I, mean, I think one of the things is that um, it's always good to get great um, feedback and have people go, you're great. Mm. But actually you learn more from yeah. saying that was crap. Newspapers, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Getting that feedback. Um, yeah. And we just had a question from Louisa. So she's asked, can you have a public chat box available for all participants to see? Absolutely. We don't have that enabled today, um, but it, it would just be another icon up the top that you would actually toggle on. And then people can click. It's not open unless you click on it. And I think that's also something useful in any platform that you find. You don't just want a chat box to be open as soon as you join. You want to give your attendees the option to open that chat box because maybe they don't want to be part of the chat. They just want to sit there and their learning style is to sort of sit back and reflect and maybe ask private questions. Um, so just remember everyone learns differently in the online environment and you don't want to overwhelm people. That's right. That that's way. tips for create uh, interactivity. Um, so what I want to go to now is accreditation mm -hmm. because there's so many different ways um, to actually provide accreditation but there's also a lot of variables as well when it comes and you sort of need to know this before you plan your event don't you? Um, to some degree, yes. Yeah. So um, you need to know what education outcomes the event is going to hit, um, and uh, and so what key learnings you want people to yeah. to actually be to to um, to gain as they're going mm. through the uh, uh, the course um, or the the event. Um, and attendance is um, so um, attendance is a, is is okay, but you know one of the things is you can have it going in the background mm. and be doing something else anyway. Mm. So um, what you actually want to be doing is giving people. Um, uh, tests that are, 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 are actually trying to get at whether those key outcomes mm. have been gathered, gathered by the individuals. And so that, and this is particularly important for CPD because what you, you don't just want to have people ticking boxes. Yep. Um, and in fact, um, there's a global move away from the whole concept of, uh, of points by hour. Mm. Um, and so we've, for years and years and years, we've, we've done, you, know, you get these amount of points for that many hours, um, and we may load them, but so we might say structured learning gives you a little bit extra, and you know home um, home reading gives you a little bit less, and so we can actually um, load those mm. things. But actually, you know, what what are you actually getting out of that learning? Mm. And then is that learning um, percolating down into practice? Mm. And so the beauty of online is that you can actually. Um, it makes it easy. I mean, you can, you, you can still do it offline. So yeah. Face to face can still do you know, a, a, a feedback to see whether the whether the event has gone well, and then a couple of weeks later, you can send them another bit of feedback to say has the you know, has this um, this learning actually percolated down into your daily practice. Yeah. So you can still do that, but online makes it a breeze, and um, and so um, the move from from CPD to PVD, which is the new value. Ah. It's a it's a, yep. a value metric. Yeah. Um, is uh, is 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 starting to take um, a, a big global kind of wave. So so it's important to do that. And and um, you know the other thing about technology is it can produce certificates very well. It can do things like manage your um, uh, your CPD goals. Mm. And so if your um, if your requirement for membership is that they is that members complete a certain mm. amount of CPD points yeah. throughout the year, um, you know the old days we used to have sheets of paper and mm. it was very complex and um, and you know messy and difficult to to assess. But now with a flick of a button, yeah. we can actually assess. You know, you've been to this event, you've you've, you've gathered the key outcomes from that from the from the the, uh, the event itself, um, and therefore we can give you this sort of point. Yeah. Um, and then those things then percolate through into um, the software, which yep. then allows you to say, well, um, you, know, um, you know, I can't rejoin 
unless I've finished my CPD. So, mm. so, and you can do things like have warnings going out mm. um, you know, in three months before they're due to have their CPD yep. um, you know, collapse on them. Um, you know, say, hey, you, you, need, you need to do CPD. So, so, yeah. um, so accreditation is important. Certification is important as well. So, you know, you, we've got a whole lot of of, um, of things. You know, the building industry is a great example of of how um, you know we've, we've reached this crisis where um, where buildings are starting to be condemned mm. because the components of the, uh, the building are, are, haven't been constructed properly. Yeah. And so, it's really important not just that. Um, People understand the learnings that they're doing in CPD, mm. but yeah. that they are they are certified as having done that, so that the um, mm. you know, we, we mitigate risk and all that stuff. And we don't have buildings falling down. Yeah, and I think um, just think of another tip on that when it comes to the variables. So knowing what you what are the variables, and whether it's just attendance or whether you want people to start. Um, attend for 80%, but you do want to have this automated. You don't want to be sitting there Absolutely. going through spreadsheets Absolutely. at the end of every session. You want someone to be able to register on the front end and put their details in, attend the event, and then depending if they met that criteria, then they may get their certificate. And that should be automated with tokens. Um, so their names just pull into it. Um, you've got your logo uploaded on your um, template, your CPD template as well. So making sure you have that flow. And also the data that you can get from the online environment is it's, it's, it's great so knowing where people are joining from what time they joined what time they left what device they were using which can help tailor your content so for example if you know that um, majority of your attendees are always on their mobile devices maybe you don't need slides as much because yeah. the slides can come up funny or maybe you do video slide overlay so we've got video and slides side by side now but we could have just a video player with slides coming over the top if we wanted to so understanding that data um, on so many levels can be really beneficial um, just to enhance the entire experience for everyone involved as well I think. And you want um, CPD can be a very dry thing so you actually do want it to be engaged mm. you don't just want people to be you know mm. to be ticking off their their, uh, their learning outcomes. You actually want them to be engaged. You want them to feel that this is an important thing for for their profession, for themselves, yeah. and you know all of our professions are are, are changing over time, and we've got to keep up mm. with new new uh, new and innovative ways of doing what we do. Yeah. And so it's really important to yeah. to to um, not just make people count you know, tick boxes, but mm. to actually have them engaged. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so. Um, so let's discuss the the, um, the 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 idea of charging. So, yeah. um, I know that lots of organisations have really felt that webinars are fr should be freebies. Mm. Um, so you know, the, the um, it should just be a free thing for members, and often they charge for non-members. Mm. But um, really, you know, this is important content. Mm. And I think people, the thing to remember is people will pay for valuable content. That's yeah. the first point on the slide right now. Um, if people are just um, attending any sort of development event or any sort of webinar where there's useful information, people can get content so easily now, yeah. so they aren't going to pay. But when it comes to CPD-related material, if you were going to charge in the first place, just because it's online, of course you should charge. Um, I think the content is key, but there are some things that you need to really look at to make sure that people do have a good experience. Because if you're going to go out and charge for your online content and then it's a poor experience for everyone online, you're not necessarily going to get them coming back as well. So it's really important that you are working with a provider that you trust. It's really good that um, technology and presenters and training is in place. And, you know, not all presenters are going to be very inspirational or engaging online. Um, and we're going to presenters in a moment. But... So even if your content is quite dry, you still need to find ways to keep people online. And they're going to stay online because obviously they they have to get their points, but it's about making them feel like they are actually engaged with you as an organisation and they are getting some value as well. But one of the things that you can do to sort of blend online and then also blend the physical side of things, and this was an example that happened at an online awards night that I attended a few weeks ago, and it was in the evening, and awards nights are always so much fun. Um, so <laughs> not that CPD events aren't. Um, but for us, it was like, oh, you know, how are we going to have this happen online? And it was on a video conference. But that morning, I received a pack, and it had a bottle of wine. It had a nice bow around it. I had some nibbles that I could eat throughout the night and a nice card from the organisation. So sending people maybe physical packs mm. as well. Um, That's a very good idea. Or if... if 
you know, it is something around, um, depending on your type of topic, you can be quite clever with it and you send it to them before the actual event starts, um, whether it is notes or, you know, in a nice notepad or something for them to make sure they take notes in your online event. So trying to get creative with stuff like that. And it's very rare that you get stuff sent in the post these days, unless it's online shopping, of course. But to have that nice surprise from people, I think, is quite nice. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's, it's um, and and it's it's it, it all goes into the uh, experience that people, uh, so the changing experience that people are finding from online mm. events. Yeah, so definitely charge. Um, and you you want to yeah. take out if you are thinking about conferences though, you do want to take out the catering fees and stuff like that. Uh, but even if you know. Thinking post-COVID, so thinking um, what's to come of events even in 2021, and I think hybrid events will become so much more common. I think that's right. Uh, Just like you can decide whether to work from home, you should be able to decide whether how you, you can gonna, how you're going to attend an event. That's right. Well, I, and I make a bold prediction, mm. um, and that's that. Here we go. Here we go. Um, I predict that, in fact, conferences are going to, you know, they're going to, the things that are driving conferences are, are social, and, yep. in fact, social is starting to be, um, uh, you know, it's, it's people are starting to get nourished socially mm. via um, web conferencing. Um, but um, I'm predicting that we're going to move to face-to-face -face events that are four hours. So masterclasses where you actually do like a whole four-hour um, uh, deep dive into the content. Um, uh, and so the, those and online delivery are going to start to replace short format face-to-face -face, um, and... Um, uh, and conferences, mm. uh, because I just think that the conferences are, are, are too expensive, too carbon, mm. too carbon intensive, um, and not enough, not enough education outcomes. So, uh, if, if it's a masterclass is going, I think you're going to be the place mm. where we're going to invest a lot of energy and time, mm. um, and and there are also those sorts of things where you can actually, so you could probably cover off mm. half your sleep deal more mm. in a masterclass. Um, which means you can focus on something specific. Yeah. And and you can also, I mean, the other um, global move uh, is in the planning of, of learning. Mm. So um, there's a whole new sort of set of of, um, uh, of principles coming in around how you value planning mm. as well. So um, to my prediction is that, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll lose conferences and, and short format face-to-faces. Yeah. And, you know, we'll, have, we'll still have social events, but they'll be social events. Mm. I mean, yeah. networking events. Yeah, yeah. And people who want to attend physical events will always attend physical events. Like, that's just the yep. type of people they are. So I do think, though, you know, to your prediction that you are going to have to provide a blended experience for people yep. um, because if you just stick to one or the other, then you're going to really, you know, condense your pool <laughs> of um, people. So um, well, one we, of the things... <laughs> sorry? And we all, we all remember that... Um, the, the, the second day of a conference when you've had the annual gala yeah, dinner yeah. where everyone's got pissed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and so it's very hard to sit through the content the next mm, day. Yeah, so, yeah. So instead of, instead of hanging it all together... Yeah, spread pipes. it out. There yeah. you go. Why not turn your two-day conference into a week or two? Um, I saw the Celebrant Society actually did that really, really well recently. Um, so they had an online conference that went for a while. You expect, and them, they, you expect them to be good at it. Oh, they were, yeah. I just saw a lot of posts and everything come up because um, obviously they're a funny bunch. So you can just imagine how funny some of their content was. And that's what sort of brings me um, to my next point around the talent and the presenters because yeah. not everyone who presents in a face-to-face -face capacity, even if they are a regular and they've done it quite a lot, not everyone can just sit behind a webinar and present. And there's, yeah. whether it's remote or in a studio or even if you are streaming something um, from a conference, how important are presenters and how can we set them up for success? Yeah, well, you, you can't be, um, be um, Wally Dali um, yeah. immediately. Yeah. You know? and, and, you, and we also, we don't expect our, our presenters mm -hmm. to be um, good at presenting necessarily yeah. because that's not, their, that's not their, their primary skill. The primary skill is in the content that we're trying to deliver mm -hmm. in an educational uh, environment. And so um, really what you've got to do is, is, um, is ensure that you're briefing them, mm -hmm. you're giving them good um, uh, uh, briefing notes. And you also, I think imp it's important to review what they're doing. So be involved to some degree in, in, the, uh, in the planning of uh, of the slide deck and, mm. sort of, and make sure you're getting the slide deck yeah, before ahead of time. Ahead, ahead of time. Um, but also, if you're going to cascade the content into um, into on uh, on demand mm. uh, units, 
And you need to think that through at the beginning. So that what you're doing is you're asking the presenter to do things like you know, present a chunk, mm -hmm. a narrative, but yeah. present a chunk and stop and pause. Mm. Just for a moment yep. so that the editor can, can slice those, those parts apart. And so um, it's about making sure that the presenter has some, some basic skills yeah. um, and, uh, and knows what, um, what, what's expected, but without, without loading them mm. with too much sort of um, you know, anchor desk mm. type, of, uh, type of skill. Um, and, but I, I have to say, though, that, um, and not to blow your trumpet mm. too hard, but uh, you've got some great resources mm. um, on the, uh, yep. on the, the your website. Mm. Um, and I, I, I made a list of them. Oh. Um, where did I put them? <laughs> so, um, you know, pro forma run sheets, yeah. um, best practice tips, um, guides to holding AGMs, dig digital event style guides, marketing ideas, um, <coughs> excuse me, great papers on, um, on compiling content. Mm. Um, but also presenter handbooks and presenter yeah. um, notes and stuff. Well, you, I think that's because we, and this is just, you know, an example of a graph. Over seven, We've done seven years of research in our Redback report, and when we ask about what makes or breaks a webinar, it definitely is presenters um, and how engaging they are as opposed to anything else. So they don't need to necessarily know how to use a webinar platform because you should have a moderator or a facilitator doing that for them. They should be there presenting their content and focusing on what they focus on best. Um, but of course, there's other tips as well. And one of the things we talk about is training presenters that you briefly mentioned, um, Lloyd. So we talk about timing, getting them trained. If you've got um, a, uh, an event, online event that's happening in a month's time, don't train your presenter a month out. No, right. You want to do it closer to the date and you want to make sure they're in the same environment as where they're going to be presenting from. You want to make sure that um, their internet and everything is set up, but you also want to walk them through how to use the platform. Yep. Um, and like you said, you know, presenters just sometimes used to turn up an event, whether it's live, um, at a physical location or a conference and just handing over a USB. Yeah. That doesn't work in the online platform. So yeah, you need to make sure that you test your slides. It's more deliberate. Yes, exactly. Um, and if you have group sessions as well, it is sometimes like hurting cats, isn't mm. it? <laughs> to try and get them involved. Um, think about panel discussions, I think. That can be more engaging. So having... Um, if you are using a studio, having a panel of maybe three or four people, and you wouldn't do this for every um, online event that you're running, but it gives people something a little bit different. Yeah. And then you can say, okay, we're going to have three experts in the field or depending on, you know, some new legislation in your industry or something else that's happening, you can actually then have a panel to discuss that and make it a little bit more engaging than just one person talking to the screen. Yeah. And the other thing I think that, um, that m moving things online gives us gives us the opportunity to do is aim big. Yeah. So um, I, I'll go back to my time at the Public Relations Institute. Um, you know, the, the board, uh, I had a list of people um, on my webinar list, which was pretty pie in the sky. Uh, one of them um, was James E. Gunig. And for anyone who knows um, anything about communication theory, James Gunig is, um, is the, the godfather mm. of uh, communication theory. Um, and, um, and so... Uh, he was he's probably the biggest name I got. I, mean, I got 300 people to that webinar. Mm. But, um, but it was just because I asked him. Mm. I went and I was bold enough to ask him. And you've got to be bold enough to then, um, as you, as you mm. say, um, you know, um, mould them into the sort of what you want for, yeah. to, for them to deliver. Yeah. So you, you've got to be strong enough to, even though this is a, a god of PR, mm. um, you need to be able to, to work with them on this. So you don't need to have the same a different presenter every time. Like if you find someone true. good, um, if you have a moderator, I definitely think you should have the same moderator throughout. So yep. there's sort of um, there's some consistency to your events that you're running as well. So having that familiar face come online every single time and welcome people to the event and then handing it off to that pre presenter. But you know, presenters, if you find a good presenter, keep them. <laughs> you know, you well, just that's, you want to have right. them present as much as possible. But, but, but also aim high. Yeah. I, mean, I think that I think that good. I mean, the good thing about about online is that you know just buy them a coffee mm -hmm. if it's. If it's America, and they've yeah. got to, you've got to get them up at some crazy crack of the do crack of dawn. Yeah. Um, buy them coffee. Yeah. Um, and and also tie it in with other things. So if they've got, a, especially important, if they've got a book coming out, if you know that one of your, you know, the, the, the uh, leaders in your field overseas has got a new book out, then tie it up with a book and and have that as part of the resource available. Uh, have the book available as a resource. Mm. So um, and that. May, means that you get a real richness to what you're being able to deliver. Yeah, I agree. Um, 
Now, the fight, we could talk about this all day, I think, um, but, you know, we're running out of time. Um, yeah. But I want to just finish on one thing, um, and that's on-demand content. Um, yep. And you're the expert in that, obviously. So we tend to focus a lot on the live here at Redback, but on-demand, obviously, if you have an LMS or something like that, thinking about how you can adapt that sort of content. And I have always been a big fan of starting with the end in mind. And you yeah. briefly alluded to that, that you need to know what you want to achieve before you actually begin your event. So can we go into some brief tips on on-demand, um, you know, how people can get the recordings, whether you can still track recordings? What are your tips for on-demand delivery? Well, so um, a couple of, of no-brainers, you know, you need good quality video, you need to, the audio has to be good, you need to be able to ensure that you can clean that audio out and so if there's noise in the background, you need to be able to clean it. So, um, so be, be a bit sort of deliberate about the, the, the actual uh, the, um, the infrastructure that you're using and what it's going to produce in terms of quality. Um, but um, the other thing is that um, really coming to the start of the planning of a webinar with um, with a range of outcomes from the content. Mm -hmm. So um, we've had lots of clients come to us. So a, a bit about us. Mm -hmm. I mean, points build is is really um, leading the field in producing in in doing what you do mm -hmm. with with um, with video with video conferencing. Mm -hmm. We do it with LMA, with, yeah. with learning learning management. And so we um, we are a serviced um, mm -hmm. uh, um, offering. Where we actually help people put the put the um, the units together, mm. um, and we've done a lot of work with organisations with webinars as well. So we've got a big backlog of webinars. That's great content, and so we've been able to pull that that, mm. that content together into great learning uh, yep. learning units. Um, but much better is to actually think it through at the beginning. So, yeah. um, and it's not just um, in, in a, a on demand learning unit that you need it to go to. Mm. You may have a whole range of things that you mm. want to. Want it to do so, it might cascade down into a range of things. So, it starts in, a, in an online mm -hmm. um, a, a, a live event, an online live event, and it cascades down into a range of other things. So, perhaps a, a micro learning unit mm. that you that you put out, or or marketing, or some other bits and pieces. And so, um, and perhaps it's a support to a um, uh, to a document. Mm. Um, and so, keep the end in mind. Mm. Um, make sure that you're, uh, those, those tips about um, about getting them, getting your speaker to mm -hmm. scrape those things off the mm -hmm. ed editing floor that they they tossed out is yep. good is a good tip. But also, you could um, even use the bloopers, I think, to promote your series and make it a little bit fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I think that the you know we we need to be also think through so the the um, the, the educational outcome. Mm. So you don't you know people are not going to be attracted to an event. If they think that they're just going to have a talking head sitting with them and they're not going to get anything out of it, yep. you, you want to have constructed within it some educational outcomes, and you want to make that um, clear to the, to the mm. presenter, uh, and you also want to be able to to brief the presenter, as I was saying before, about pausing between between units and 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 keeping a narrative and and then doing a, a, mm. a, a recording post the event so that you can actually have more content to, to do. I think the other thing to think about, and one thing I just, when people say, okay, we've got the recorded content, we're just going to go put it um, on something where they can't track as much behaviour. So I think there's two things to yeah. look at. Single sign-on, I think, is very important. Very important. So yep. you don't, if you've got four pieces of content, do you want everyone to log into a portal to watch that content and then you can get individual reporting? Or do you ha want your members to log in to every Every single event and actually type in their details again. So trying to make it easy for people to access your on-demand recording um, reporting is quite important. Um, but I also that, that, that let me interrupt you for a second. Yeah. That also um, is true for the the um, the marking of yeah. So yeah. so um, you know people get really bored with having to do um, continually coming in and mm. put all their CPD in. If in fact it's all if the single sign-on and single, yeah. um, you know, they we're able to use an API to transfer that information into your your membership system, yeah. then in fact you can actually start to manage that stuff really easily. And you know, one of the problems with a lot of this stuff is that it's admin intensive, mm. and if you can strip that out and yep. make it automated, fantastic. so much better. Yeah.
Uh, well, that brings us to the end. I think well, uh, we're right good. on time. But um, I really want to thank you for joining me today. Like I said, um, it's a very short amount of time to cover so many different topics. But um, everyone can download the white papers um, from the actual resource folder. Um, you can get in touch if you have any questions, either of us, um, whether it's um, streaming your actual events, running your online CPD programs or hosting them um, or information around LMS systems that Points Build provide. Um, but thank you so much. Okay. It was fun. Before you yep. wrap it up, though, I think that we, we need to be very clear about the fact that we now are working together. Yes, and so, yes. And so um, one of the good, it's a, it makes a really powerful offering now mm. that we can both, um, so we can we can actually help you know, uh, webinar people, mm. putting webinars together to actually build those things to, in, into their, yeah. their, uh, their planning. Um, and also, we can actually um, have live events um, in our mm. um, in, in our offering as well. So it's been a great, a very powerful mm. um, connecting up of yeah. uh, of services. Um, and um, and so um, again, if you want to chat to us about that, mm. um, that's a it's a really uh, it's a good new partnership. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you.